Good morning, folks. It's nice to see some of you folks that are brave enough to come out and join us and worship the Lord together. Uh, I'm reminded of what the psalmist said about the Lord. Because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I shall call upon him as long as I live. What a wonderful song. What a wonderful challenge for life. Let's just open up a word of prayer, shall we? Our Lord Jesus, it is a delight again to be in your house, to worship you together, uh, whether in here in presence or on the internet. We are grateful, Lord, that we can come together to worship our Savior. Lord, may you bless our service today as we gather today. May we hear your voice speak to us through your Holy Spirit, I pray. In Christ's name. Well, last week uh, we had a little bit of a musical group up here with Annette playing the piano and so forth, and she was scheduled to come today, but she got a migraine this morning, and those of you who suffer with migraines know how debilitating those things can be, so we want to pray for Annette this morning, and Ron has graciously volunteered to fill in the gap a little bit with a couple of numbers of us this morning, so I'm going to call upon Ron. Good morning. When Dan called me at nine-ish this morning to tell me a little change in plans, I had to kind of dig out an old song from back a little ways, an old John Peterson number, and I think a lot of you may know this one. I know who heard this one last summer at the outdoor concert we had. And uh, so let's continue to worship the Lord as I sing, This Love Is Mine.
what's going on. So when you leave this morning, remember to follow the arrows out and around, and uh, let's keep our distance and just be safe. All right, all right. Lady John is here. Uh, I know some people are wondering uh, about the finances of the church. And, uh, and when we started out a few months ago, everything seemed to be running along very well, giving the staying good and, and maintaining a certain level. But I have to tell you this morning that over the last four weeks, five weeks, giving has dropped. And uh, just so you know where we are as a church, um, please remember that giving uh, needs to continue the same as your personal worship of God through the days, even though we're not able to be here in the way that we normally would be here on Sunday mornings. And so um, just a small request, if you ever dropped off and you're giving or you're got it stored up, uh, like some people, and waiting for the opportunity to bring it, Please, uh, we can use all the uh, funds that uh, we can get right now. We're running a little bit in the red, and uh, we need to get ourselves back up out of that, uh, even as the summer progresses. So just a little uh, update on where we are financially. And uh, if you are home and you would like for us to come and get it, we're willing to do that. The box, lock box is here in the church all week long uh, during the hours the church is open. And uh, you can also give uh, by e-transfer, which has been a, a big help uh, throughout the, the last few weeks and months. And so um, whatever it takes for you to be able to give, um, we trust that you will uh, bless the Lord in your giving uh, as we continue on through the summer months. And we appreciate it. Thank you. Well, it is the summer months, and I thought we would take a hiatus from Acts and just uh, look at the Psalms through the summer months. And so uh, this morning I begin a series of Psalms. But before we look at the Word of God, let's spend a few moments together, shall we? Father, we just come before you, and we just want to pause and quiet our hearts, prepare to hear from you. As we open the Word of God, Lord, we know that the Word itself is living and active. And we pray that as we read your Word, Lord, that it would speak to our very lives. Lord, as I speak this morning, I pray that the words are anointed by you. And I pray, Father, that we're not looking so much for the three points in a poem, as they say, but rather looking for what it is your spirit wants to communicate to our lives this morning. And that could be different for everybody here. So I pray, Father, that you would just uh, speak through our, the message this morning according to your spirit's working. May we not harden our hearts. May we be open, willing, and receptive to hear from you. This morning I want to continue to pray for our camp and other Christian camps that run this summer, we pray for the safety of the children. And uh, I speak specifically, of course, of this virus, that if it comes to any camp, we know that they're going to have to shut down immediately. And Lord, we want the kids to hear about Jesus Christ and their love for, him, for them. Lord, so many kids who come to camp today do not come from church homes, do not have the Christian upbringing that many of us are blessed with. And they need to hear of your love for them. Oh Lord, keep the camps safe in the summer, we pray. And we pray many children will come to know you this summer. I pray for our own churches. We uh, many are starting to look to the fall already. And uh, how it's going to look. Things are going to look a little different. And yet the ministry will not cease. It just may be a little differently. And we pray that you could use it, that you would bless it, that uh, the Spirit of God will work through however we function, and that it would reach into the lives and hearts of people of our community. Lord, we pray for our community. 
Lord, we so dearly wish, as you wish, that all people would have a saving knowledge of you. That would be so wonderful. And uh, we just pray for any who do not, and we have contact with them. May you just uh, create a friendship there, a bond, that we would be able to share your gracious love with people. I'm so grateful for the other churches in our community who gather this day. Each of them being served by a pastor who knows you, who loves you, and believes that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, and that Jesus finished the work of, uh, of being our intercessor between us and you. And I just pray, Father, your blessing upon every church as they gather this day. Now just open our hearts and speak to our, our lives, I pray this morning as we look into your word in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are going to turn to Psalm chapter 2. Uh, why I'm starting at Psalm chapter 2 is because I preached Psalm chapter 1 last summer. So we're going to go to Psalm chapter 2 today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open with me. If not, just listen carefully. The psalmist writes, Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs, and the Lord scoffs at them, and he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them like earthware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he may not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Ronald Reagan, Jr., former uh, son of former U.S. President Ronald Reagan, says that religion is a delusion. And in a recent video, he signs off by saying the following, Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist and not afraid of burning in hell, as he shakes his fist towards heaven. Interesting, his father once said these words, Without God, there is no virtue because there is no promoting of conscience. Without God, democracy will, can, will not and cannot endure. If we forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation God under. Talk about a contrast. In Canada, there is a group out there called the Canadian Secular Alliance who are trying desperately to change our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms to eliminate the clause, the clause under the supremacy of God. Countries like China, North Korea, and others shake their fists at God openly. The former Soviet Union and the whole Eastern Bloc, they tried to wipe out any use for or belief in God. And eventually, we saw the demise of these countries. I think former President Ronald Reagan had it right when he said, without God, there is no virtue because there is no promoting of conscience. Without God, democracy will not and cannot endure. And if we forget that we are one nation under God, that we will be a nation I don't think, unless the church stands up and is accounted for, that we are too far away from the secular alliance having their way in our constitution. It would seem more and more in Canada we are trying to silence God in our nation. 
What are the results? High crimes, abortion, euthanasia, divorce, violence, violence against women, just to name a few. And as we as a nation at one time stood against the secularism of the Cold War, now we are underhandedly, we are beginning to embrace the very things we once shook our heads at as something that was wrong and evil. And we are embracing it. There is an active movement in Canada to eliminate God from our morals and ethics. When we eliminate God, where then do we turn to for ethics? Can a godless nation find an ethic? Whose ethics do we live by? Without God, there is no ethic to tell us that what Hitler did was wrong. There is no ethic to tell us that communism was wrong. Or it still is. There is no ethic to stand up against China. No ethic to stand up against abortion, euthanasia, and so many other things when we have no godly ethic. Without God, there is no supreme ethic. Indeed, it can be argued without God, there is no ethic, period. Who's to say, for example, rape is wrong if there is no ethic? guide us. Malachi 3 verse 6 says these words in part, For I, the Lord, do not change. In other words, God's word is true for all peoples of all times and all places. Thou shalt not murder applies to everyone in all times and all places and all people groups. Without God, well, thou shalt not murder does not apply to someone like Hitler. Thou shalt not murder does not apply to the former Soviet Union, to China, and other communist countries. God's ethics, God's morals are forever, for all times, for all people, and all places. And we can laugh at them, and we can shake our fists at them, but at the end of the day, we will be accountable. What does our text says, say? It says that the nations are in an uproar, people are devising vain things. It says the kings of the earth are taking their stand against God. Their stand against what? Verse 2 tells us that their stand is against the Lord and against this anointed one, Jesus Christ. That to me sounds like it was written in 2020. We in the West were very pleasure-centered. And so we argue that the end justifies the means. It doesn't matter who we step on or why, as long as at the end of the day, we are happy. Therefore, we have no need for God, God, as a matter of fact, kind of holds us back from some of those things we enjoy in life. What is the chief pleasure of our day, folks? We don't talk about it in the church hardly ever. But I'm going to mention it today. The chief pleasure of our day, folks, is sex. There. I said it. The huge word, sex. Churches are literally sticking their heads in the sand, completely ignoring the problem of sex in our culture. Our culture has a very unhealthy preoccupation towards the desires of sex. We see it in movies, we see it in magazines, in TV shows, advertisements. Virtually everywhere is sex driven. And we have sexualized women to the point that we no longer we feel the need control our emotions or place our emotions on the authority of God's word that thou shalt not commit adultery. And so women are nothing more than objects to many men. We see the mistreatment of women in the way they are passed over for advancements in the workplace and equal pay and in their weight and their gray hair, how they dress, and for many women are nothing more than sexual objects to please men. 
And as a culture, we mistreat women because we refuse, we refuse to listen to God's word. And you know, the sad thing is, sometimes a Christian is no better than the secular person. And they don't realize it. God places a high value upon every human being, no matter what their gender. We are currently struggling in our society with the Black Lives Matter movement. But you know what? In Christ Jesus, this is no issue. They, black lives, colored people of all different shades, are all people who are valued and made in the image of God. We are equal. We can take the Ten Commandments and believe it in the fall. I'm going to go through a series on the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. But we can take the Ten Commandments and see our culture is literally shaking its fist at God and pushing Him out of our lives. And we reap the rewards of our sinfulness. Of course, the sexual pleasure has cost our culture broken marriages, sexual diseases, and it has broken the lives of many children and many homes. It used to be AIDS was the one big thing that we were all afraid of. We can remember when the early days, when the, it started coming out, we were terrified of AIDS. And you know what? Today there are far more sexual transmitted diseases that are far more deadly and dangerous than AIDS. But God, who needs them? We want our pleasures. We don't need God. Why would I want God to stymie my sexual pleasures, my sexual feelings, my, pre my pleasures justifying my needs? The end justifies the means. God's ethic, my friends, speaks into sexual pleasures outside of the bonds of marriage. The world is angry at God. And why is that? Because God points out sin. God points out moral living. God points out holiness. We don't want that because we want our sinful pleasures. And so the nations, even today, are pushing God out. And in turn, I believe they're losing out on the blessings God has stored up for them. Humankind is sitting back and humankind is laughing at God. We don't need God to tell us how to live and how to live. Science tells us how we got here anyways. And how we came about. We no longer need this ancient book that is full of myths and fables in our lives telling us how we should live. Look at verse 4. It says this. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Verse 5, he says, Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. Is God surprised as to what is going on in our world today? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, he's laughing. Listen, the world thinks that if they can get away from God, we can be free. The less I have in God, the freer I will be. <clears throat> and perhaps some of us deep down feel if we could just get away from God's ethics and morals, we too can be free. Let me tell you something. We all serve someone. It could be our human leaders, it could be our organization, the pursuit of self-satisfaction, and yes, it could be the pursuit of God. But here's the thing. A fish is not free when it leaves the water. We are not free when we abandon or live without the Lord Jesus Christ. The only path to personal happiness and joy is found in, in a living relationship with the living God. And why is that? Because we cannot be the person we were created to be unless we are in a relationship with our Creator lover of our soul. God created us for relationships. Without that relationship, life is not what it could be, it should be. 
Doesn't it seem odd to you that God laughs at this? Odd of me. When our children make mistakes, we don't laugh at them. We correct them and help them to do things the right way. Why does God laugh? He laughs because of their confused thoughts about their power. It's the laughter we get when our little three-year-old puts a towel around their necks and pretends they're a superhero as they jump off the couch. I remember when my son Stephen was just a, just a little fella, under five, I remember specifically. And like most dads, I would, we would wrestle around once in a while. And once in a while, I would let my son pin me. And I, and I would holler, I surrender, I surrender, mercy. Those of us who have been dads have probably been there. And boy, did his face light up. Oh my goodness, he would run to Fiona and he'd say, I made Dad surrender! And he was so excited. He thought he was, it was the greatest achievement of his little life. And inside, I was laughing with joy. I was laughing with joy. As a father, I knew the boundaries he had as a little child. And I know as well as you, there is absolutely no way that he could cause me to surrender. Uh, outside of my great love for him to pretend that I was surrendering to him. Every nation that exists, God knows their boundaries. Every nation is limited, but God is transcendent. Now there's a word we use, but what does it mean, transcendent? So I looked up the dictionary definition that says this. The transcendence of God expresses the truth that God in himself is infinitely exalted above all creation. We as humans think we're pretty smart. We think we're pretty powerful because of all the war efforts and abilities we have to defend ourselves. We think we, we have done away with God, with science. And God himself is, a, is a, a creation of the human mind and that's it. And God laughs. You people think you're smart. You know something? Before God created the world, He knew every kingdom that would ever exist. He knew when they would start, and He knows when they're going to fall. I want to look at an example with you. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Daniel with me. An example of kingdoms coming and going according to God's mighty hand. Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to begin in verse 26. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel, the king, uh, Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, con conjurers, magicians, or diviners are able to declare it to my king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. As for you, O king, while you were in your bed, your thoughts turned to what would take place in the future. He who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me for many, for any wisdom residing in me more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making interpretation known uh, to the king, and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. O king, you were looking, and behold, there is a single great statue. Now here's the thing, you've got to understand the parts of the statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue is made of fine gold, its, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue at its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. And then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time because light chaff from the summer threshing floor and the wind 
carried them along so that not a trace of them was found, but the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole, uh, the whole earth. This was the dream. Now, we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven was given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And whether the sons of men or the beasts of the field or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and it caused you to be ruler over them. You are the head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. After you, have, after you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you and another third kingdom bronze which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. And as much as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks its piece, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be divided, a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron, in as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mix and the common clay, they will be combined with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to another, even as iron does not combine with the pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set a, uh, up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that the kingdom will not be left for another people. It will, be, it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out uh, of the mountain without hands, and it is crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and gold, the great God has made known to the kingdom that will take place in the future, so that the dream is true, that its interpretation is trustworthy. This is the famous passage uh, that represents the statues of the various kingdoms of the world. Each kingdom was strong and mighty. But as the statue moved from the head and described the different uh, parts of the statue as it came lower and lower, it got weaker and weaker. Each kingdom got a little weaker. And the world can tie around its neck a towel and pretend that signifies that they're a superhero, but God has granted them so much uh, uh, freedom, if you will, and no more. Often today we do not see prophecy handed down to us like Daniel's uh, uh, situation, but we see prophecy fulfilled as time goes on. We may be witnessing before us, for example, the dominance of the U.S. eroding. Now, I'm not saying I want to see that. Please don't get me wrong. But with the way they're treating this coronavirus, they may be brought to their knees. And as time goes on, time will tell. Our world is full of people, and I won't mention names, but I'm sure you can think of them uh, yourself, who boast in their power, who boast in their military might, their abilities to cast fear in the lives of people. They rant and rave against God, saying, I am God. And God laughs, knowing that any power that they do have comes from Him. And just as easily as he gave them the power, like that statue, he can throw that stone and crush that nation, and it can be done with. I hope in Canada we never do see a tyrant leader, but I know this for sure if it does happen, and we do get a tyrant leader one day, whether they acknowledge it or not, they are in God's hands. If you want to remove a tyrant from leadership, you need to pray. Pray. Pray that God would move the mountains to remove that person from power. What then is the warning to us? Well, check out verse 12. It says, do homage to the Son. We in the West, in our freedoms, we enjoy perhaps more so than those in countries where they risk their very lives to be Christians, to be accounted for. We need, and North America, we need to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. You 
You know, we in the church in the West, we're not sitting here shaking our hands up at God in the same way as they do in those places where they don't believe in God and are actively trying to shove God out of the world. But in many ways, the church is still doing that, even in North America. One lovely lady was speaking to her pastor one day, confessing her problem with alcohol and her problem with anger. And this lady said she wanted uh, more of God in her life and wanted God to uh, lead her life. And she compared herself in her conversation with a lovely Christian lady in her church who said she is a fine Christian lady, but she didn't want to be like her because she was too religious. I think whether conscious or not, many in the church today are resisting, surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ because they don't want to become too religious. I think many in the church today have gotten comfortable with how much of our lives we allow God to speak into so much, but not this much. No further. Holiness is something we need to talk about as a church, as a culture in North America. We need, we nod our heads in agreement over anything that's said about holiness. But so many are still holding on so tightly to the things that keep them from enjoying the full blessings of a surrendered life to God. For some of the church today, unfortunately I know prayer is something rarely done. For so many in the church today, I know for a fact that reading the Bible for some is rarely done in the Christian church, in the Christian home. They say, they can't say the last time they remember God speaking into their lives about something to change their character into the image of God. And this is the life of people in the church in the West. Friends, there is more to being a Christian than being a nice person. There is more to being a Christian than being part of any church. Christianity is about an active, two-way relationship between you and the living God. So let us be careful that we are not suddenly shaking our fists at God and saying, you can have so much God, but not this much. We may not be devising a plan to live contrary to God's word, speaking in our lives, but we certainly aren't growing in the Lord either so often. Is there something in our passage today that speaks to your life? I know there is much there that spoke to me this week. I know that I am far from perfect, and I am in need of God's grace and mercy every single day of my life. I know that God would love to have more of my life and that I need to surrender more of my actions and attitudes and thoughts and behaviors unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not perfect. How about you? And our song closes by saying these words, How blessed are all who take refuge how are we doing with that? How are we doing with taking refuge in God? When trials come in our lives, we can feel very defeated. Or, in when trials come, are we turning to God in our times of needs? Psalmist calls us blessed when we turn to God. Blessed. This, my friends, is available to all of us. No one is exempt. No one's excluded. I don't believe any Christian is overtly shaking their fists at God. I really don't. But we need to be careful not to tell God that what part of our lives He's allowed into and what part of our lives He's not allowed to touch. And 
Uh, but letting him into your whole life, we need to do that. Maybe today you are someone who has had a problem with flying off the handle a little too quickly. God can give you peace. Maybe you have separated your work life from your Christian life. They should blend together beautifully. Maybe you're a Christian who never opens your Bibles and never prays. And you know that we know there are many like this. Self is on the throne of your life. Jesus is Lord. He is sitting in the heavens. Friends, we don't place Jesus as Lord of our lives. Jesus is Lord of our lives. He is the one who came down from heaven. He is the one who took on the form of humanity. He is the one who died on the cross for our sins. He is the one who defeated death for us. He is the one who rose from the dead. He is the one who is now our high priest interceding for us in heaven. He is the Lord and King of our lives. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. So here is my challenge for us today. We talk about the world turning its back on God. We talked about being in control of all things. And as I said at the outset, I am not interested if you got my points today. What I want you to do is I want you to wrestle with one thing in your life that you've been withholding from God. And ask God to give you the strength to give that up to Him. That's what I know have listened to a sermon. Not my points. You've listened to a sermon and heard from God through His Holy Spirit speaking to you. So how is God prompting you today? That is my point. What, you need, what do you need to do to surrender to Him? Let's pray. Father, we are on a spiritual journey together. And Lord, we acknowledge right up front, not one of us is perfect. We acknowledge right up front that we are all in need of your grace and mercy every day, your forgiveness. Father, as we consider these words this morning from this great song, Lord, we don't want to be people who are shaking our fists at God. We want to be people who are growing in your love and grace. Growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Growing in our faith. Lord, I just pray that there's one thing that you are laying on the heart of everyone sitting here today, and including myself standing here. That we may hear from your voice, of your spirit, speaking to our lives. May we be brave and have the courage to give something back to you as we worship you today. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. And Ron has a closing song for us. Let's continue to worship our awesome God as I sing a song called My Song. See? 
makes fun of me at the end of the service when I pronounce a benediction and I raise my hands. And she likes to make a great joke of that at home. I do that for a reason, and I want to read for you the reason. In Numbers, uh, God is speaking to Moses, and this is what he says, and this is a benediction we say often. Uh, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel, and you shall say to them, and here is the blessing God gives to you and his church. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. 